1st of February 2023 <clears throat> John Hammond coming to you from Norwich UK yesterday I, I spent a, a bit of time on YouTube listening to some very intriguing topics <clears throat> and as I was listening to this and I don't necessarily need to name these people there was a lot of truth in what they were saying uh, of course because the truth is the truth but uh, the way they were saying it was was a bit like a psychic medium telling us things and giving an illustration and it was it was like listening to a psychic the spirit is saying spirit is telling me lord is telling me and the lord is telling me right now the spirit is telling me right now uh, and it was very much like very much like a psychic medium and now i've never been to a spiritualist church i, I would never go but I do know what the format is because we've all seen uh, stuff on TV, documentaries, whatever. <clears throat> we know the format, that they're inviting the spirit to speak to them. And of course, it is about the dead, the departed, so-called. But we know it's a, it's a counterfeit form of religion it is a religion in itself it is spiritualism run by spiritists who are psychic mediums so-called clairvoyance <clears throat> psychics and the way they speak is spirit is saying lord is telling me and of course when you have the holy spirit within you and you are discerning what spirit they're coming from and you get what I call a check in your spirit and you're just not sure that they're in the Holy Spirit but they're telling you things that seem correct and even prophecies even talking about King Charles even talking about the demise of the Queen before Charles took the throne, people are saying they saw things, they saw things, they saw things. <clears throat> Not quite predicting the day of her death, but very much saying in hindsight, they said this, that and the other before she died. And then they have things to say about King Charles. And they say, the Lord is saying, the Spirit is saying. We, as true disciples of Christ, with the Holy Spirit, exercising spiritual gifts, which include prophecy, wisdom, words of knowledge, we can discern things. And we can overuse the phrase, the Lord is saying, the Holy Spirit is saying. And I very rarely mention the Holy Spirit, except by his full description, the Holy Spirit, the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit. I very rarely use the Spirit is saying, because I know there are people out there, they think they are hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying, but they're hearing what a Spirit is saying. <clears throat> so from now on, I'm going to be listening to what people are saying about the future, calling it prophecy, to distinguish exactly what they are saying and what is God saying. And like I said, the truth is the truth. They can give an illustration that is very appropriate, very apt. But, but... We know there are counterfeit gifts. We know the enemy masquerades as an angel of light. So the enemy can masquerade as a 
spiritual minister. Now, for those of us who are Christian, we might think that is the Holy Spirit minister, ordained by God himself. But of course, ordination comes from God, big G. But we also know the enemy has his so-called ministers in places of influence, authority, control, that largely the pulpit is controlled by the minister or ministers of that local church. The pulpit, the place of speaking, formal speaking in the front. Many years ago, I went to a, let's call it a, a rigid denominational church meeting one Sunday morning and uh, the chairs were all in a rigid state and the service was very much by the book and uh, <clears throat> the Lord told me to go there for a season and I followed the procedure the religious practice to stand up and sing but when I stood up to sing the hymn, I knew I didn't know the hymn, I didn't know the tune. And, and the Lord clearly told me, sit down, look at the, the hymn itself, the words in the book, and meditate on the words, and that is your worship. To focus on the words they're singing because I didn't know the, the words, I didn't know the, the song, the, the tune. <clears throat> so I sat down. And um, every time a hymn was given, they stood up and I was sitting down. But I was looking at the book and I was focusing on the words. Word by word, line by line, thought by thought. And of course, these old hymns of those days in the 90s, they were very, very meaningful, very theological, doctrinally sound, correct. And looking at the words, I did learn things from looking at the words while they were singing the song. But after the service, the vicar came to me and he said, um, basically, what are you doing here? Because he saw that I didn't fit in, literally didn't fit in to the group. I didn't copy what the group was doing. And I stood out like a sore thumb. And he said to me clearly, what are you doing here? But not in a, in a gentle way. It was like he couldn't understand, they couldn't understand. And it came across like, what are you doing here? And I said, that's a funny question. I said, I'm worshipping God. What are you doing here? Now, I wasn't being cheeky. It was, a, a, it was a correct response to him. As you sow, you reap. I'm worshipping God here. What are you doing here? And of course, he didn't, he didn't say that he was worshipping God. He, what he did say was, there are people here who don't understand why you don't stand up for the hymns. And I said, there is a very good reason. And he, he anticipated the answer. He said, OK. I said, I'll tell you what, let me speak from the pulpit next week for five minutes and I'll tell them, I'll tell them the reason I don't stand up. And instead of him saying, yeah, brilliant idea, John, then you can talk, talk to them all at the same time. He, of course, said, you can't speak from the pulpit because you haven't got a license from the bishop. Of course. Now, I didn't know I needed a license to speak from the pulpit of any of God's churches. I didn't know that was the rule. <clears throat> And that is the rule of certain denominations, of course, and uh, other denominations have that rule. It's not, un it's not written down, it's an unwritten rule, but very rarely 
would someone be invited to take the pulpit and speak to the congregation without the minister's approval, vetting, because this is how they would want to protect the flock. Many years ago, uh, earlier than this incident I'm telling you about, probably the late 80s, early 90s, in Norwich, I went to a certain Pentecostal church one evening. And it was very much a gospel evening in those days. The evening service was preaching the gospel to the lost. And people knew that if you wanted to bring someone to Christ, you brought a friend or a guest to that meeting to hear the gospel preached. So I visited this uh, Pentecostal church. It was the Assemblies of God, as was called. So I visited them on a Sunday evening. And as I was entering the place on my own, the man at the door, the, uh, the welcomer, he shook my hand and he said to me, have you brought a word from the Lord for us this evening? I was quite surprised. I'd never heard of that before. And um, I, I looked at him. I said, um, no, I've just come to see what, what's happening here. He said, oh, OK, fine. He said, it's just that when a stranger arrives, often the Lord has sent them with a word for us. Now, that was the AOG, Assemblies of God, Pentecostal Church Group in Norwich. And that was a sign to me they were expecting God to send a messenger with a message for them out of the blue, unexpected. And that was a genuine opportunity to speak into the life of that local church. And as I said, I, I didn't have anything to say at that time. So back to the Anglican Church situation in the 90s, and remember we're talking about 25 years ago, people then were as rigid as the pews of the church building, and people were very much stuck in a place, unchanging tradition going on for centuries by the book, and everything had to happen by the book. So. When I suggested to the vicar that he let me speak from the pulpit next week for five minutes and I would explain it to them, and he said, you need a license from the bishop. I said, that's okay. I said, if they ask me over the teas and coffees afterwards, I'll tell them. I'll tell them. So the vicar had a message now to go to the uh, ones who were inquirers Let's not call them complainers. They literally didn't understand why I didn't stand up with them. The vicar had a, a message to take to them. If you ask John, he will tell you the reason. And I would say the reason I've, I've told you. My worship was to obey God, A, to be there in that place, B, to comply with what the Spirit was saying, in the place, the Holy Spirit. And when they stood up for me to uh, open the book, meditate on the words and pray and receive what we were singing to God was meaningful and I was receiving it for myself personally. And that was 25 years ago. So the vicar had the instruction to go to his congregation and just say to them, look, if you've got any questions for John, put it straight to him. He'll give you his answer. And of course, nobody did. Church of England, English people, very reserved, very reserved, shy, embarrassed, fearful, very reserved, stiff upper lip, 25 years ago. Things have changed. Pews get taken out. Flexible seating arrangements come in. And hopefully there's more freedom, more informality for people to give out words. 
scriptures, knowledge, wisdom, prophecies, as led by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> it is essential, I've said it before, it is essential when we lead someone to Christ, when they make that commitment to Christ, when they ask Jesus to be Lord of their life, yes, I'm a sinner, please forgive me, I recognize you died for me, Jesus. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Lord, forgive me. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Once people have made that confession, I am a sinner. I am repenting. I ask you, Lord, to forgive me. Father, forgive us our trespasses. At that moment, you are forgiven. But now you need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Full immersion, water or fire, both, as led by the Holy Spirit. Philip and the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian said, look, there's water here. Is there any reason I can't be baptized in water now? Now that I've understood who Jesus is, now that he's my saviour, as a sign of my dying to self, I want to be baptised in water. Look, there's water here. And of course he was baptised with the water. Baptised with water and fire, whichever order that comes. One person I knew, and I knew them personally, um, they were going through the full immersion baptism one Sunday evening. And as she was standing in the water, and let's call it the officials were there uh, to lower her in and raise her up. As, as she was standing there, uh, the leader of the meeting said, if anybody knows this person, just pray for them now. And I prayed out. When, when that's right. When when she when she came up from the water, when she was standing there, all soaking wet, the leader said, "If anybody knows this person, just pray for them now." And I prayed, "Lord, baptize her with the Holy Spirit." And she went. She just went out in the spirit, fell back in the water. They sort of caught her as she was falling, but she not rebaptized. But she went out in the spirit, where the spirit of the living God came upon her, the fire of God, the Holy Spirit, and she went back into the water and they lifted her up again. It was a sign to us all to, to be born again, baptized with the Holy Spirit and with water. We are living in a very complicated time, year 2023, where religious rituals and sacraments and traditions override the Holy Spirit himself. But when we do these things by faith that God has said to do this act, ritual, you want to call it a ritual, an act, an act of obedience is a better term to baptize someone in water is not a ritual, it's not a routine. And it, as an act, doesn't save anybody. No more than taking communion saves that person. Because Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ died then. And we remember that act of sacrifice of the Lamb of God. So taking bread and wine to remember Jesus died is one thing, but to, to put into the bread and wine any anything that says that if you take the bread and wine you are saved, that's not true. It's a lie. Because eating and drinking doesn't save anybody. <clears throat> No more than killing a lamb and covering yourself with the blood of the lamb physically 
does anything for you. It doesn't. And if you think God is telling anybody to kill animals now and cover themselves and others with the blood, physical blood, that is not God. That's just a religious thing. Spiritual sacrifice. The sacrifices of God, a broken spirit, a contrite heart that God will not despise. A sacrifice that we make. Spirit. Soul. Body. In that order. Led by the Holy Spirit himself. Spirit and truth. The Holy Spirit and Jesus leading us to the Father along the narrow way. And there is only one way we know, Jesus Christ. John 14, 6, Isaiah 35, the high way of holiness, Christ's holiness, purity, faith, love, righteousness. All of this is about Christ and his his blood is on us. The angel of death passes over because his blood is on us. Of course, we are still mortal beings. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Man is, if man is born once, he dies and faces judgment. Only God knows the day of our death. Physical death. Only God knows. God knows the future. So, test and weigh everything by the Holy Spirit, by scriptures, and the fellowship of one another in the same Holy Spirit. Where two or three are agreed, God says, I am with you. God says. God is saying. And my God is your God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Yahweh, Yeshua, Messiah, the living God, the light, the truth, the teacher, the King above all kings, the Lord above all lords, the teacher above all teachers, teaches us what we, sometimes we forget, we need to be reminded, the washing of the word, the cleansing of the mind by the washing of the word, the living word of Christ. So God bless you, brethren of the one God. I'm heading into the city now. There's a drop-in in the city where people come, pray for each and every one of them. Some already know Christ. Some don't. And, and uh, there's everybody in between. We're all work in progress. We're all being changed, transformed, conformed into the likeness of Christ. So pray that religious spirits, they will be in the room, so to speak. Pray that the righteousness of us, God's people, will surpass that of the Pharisees and that they'll have no foothold to interrupt what the Holy Spirit is saying and through us doing. God bless you where you are. Today, look out for, find, seek and find a fellow sheep. Found sheep or lost sheep. That is your purpose today. And share the good news with them. Share the truth. Share the living bread, the living water. And may the Lord fill you and us with light, his pure, holy light that outshines any counterfeit light that people might believe they're under, that they're being led by a light. But unless it's the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a counterfeit light, light of Lucifer, who is the God of this age. So the light of this world is under the God of this age. But the light of Jesus Christ 
is the light of God. John 1. The light overcomes the darkness every time. God bless you. We'll speak again by the will of God. God bless.